rise only to check that you received the email over lunch. Thank you. Very Thank much. you. Oh, uh, I didn't. Sorry, but I was I was bombarded with emails. I expect it's my clerk's fault. The judgment. That, that's with the judgment of the yeah. upper tribunal judgment. All right. Good afternoon. Um, Can I, I'll, I'll just ask my judicial assistant to go and find uh, my clerk has been sent. Actually, yours yeah. is, uh, I got it printed out. So it's not in judgment. Right. Okay. You know, I do need another one now, but can you print it in your note and put it on my desk? Yes, Mr. Kemp. Good afternoon. Um, the answer to this appeal, we say, is straightforward. PF is good law. The tribunal in the instant case directed itself to the relevant passages of PF, and it plainly had PF in mind. Far from launching into an evaluation, we note that this tribunal judgment was conspicuously careful and closely reasoned, and we say it discloses no error of law. <coughs> in terms of structure of my submissions, I'm going to mirror those of my learned friend and deal with ground one first, of course, and deal with the touchstone of the statute, um, which also lies at the heart of uh, the matter we submit, section 42B of the Act. Um, I don't think there's any need to bring that up, um, but the words, in any finding of fact, we submit, necessarily include findings as to whether the individual did the impugned act. While well, only friend's submissions with respect rest on a hidden scheme, there's nothing in section 42B that requires the upper tribunal to identify a mistake in the DBS's consideration of the evidence or in the process. The act merely requires the upper tribunal to identify a mistake in any finding of fact on which the borrowing decision is based. So we say um, that the plain words um, do not support my learned friend's um, ground one of the appeal. As to purpose, um, the mistake of fact jurisdiction is an important element to ensure that the statutory scheme is just. Um, it's a safeguard for the individual. That's the purpose of Section 42B of the Act. The DBS might find that a person has done something which they deny doing and has not done. That individual has no right to an oral hearing before the DBS, um, before it makes a borrowing decision. Of course, it can, they can make written representations, but no right to an oral hearing before the DBS. And the individual, we know, has no right to a full merits appeal um, to a, before a court uh, it, in the sense that they have no right to challenge the appropriateness of the decision to place them on the barring list. That um, is excluded under Section 4.3. The individual is, however, able to bring an appeal under Section 4, and the tribunal is able to put any mistake of fact right. And we submit that for justice to be maintained in the scheme, it must be right that the appeal tribunal is able to consider whether the accused has done the impugned act as a matter of fact. And we get some support for that submission from a relatively old case now, but the Royal College of Nursing um, case in the Administrative Court. Um, and it's um, AB um, Authorities Bundle, page 152. this was, was it was a judicial review by the Royal College of Nursing challenging the lawfulness of the scheme operated by the DBS's predecessor, the ISA, um, on human rights grounds, um, Article, Article <coughs> 8 and Article 6. And the relevant passages, I want to take the lordships to, is uh, paragraph 103 on 184 of the authorities article. Sorry, 183, uh, 102H. H of 183. And we've got there Mr. Justice Wynne Williams saying um, what he understood uh, the phrase a mistake in any finding of fact to mean. I can see no reason why the subsection should be interpreted restrictively. It's broad. I think everyone agrees on that. Um, and he goes on at um, 103 over the page at uh, 184 to uh, explain why 
um, the scheme was uh, compatible with Article 6. Um, and the availability of the mistake of fact jurisdiction is an essential part of that um, compatibility or non-infringement of Article 6. Um, you see there at the bottom of 103, any other error of law and relevant errors of fact made by the ISA can be put right on an appeal, which may itself be conducted by way of all hearing an appropriate case. Now, if um, the um, Section 42B jurisdiction was restricted in the way argued for by the DBS, that, in my submission, um, would undermine the justice of the scheme. We what say does he mean, then, when he says at 104, I'm more troubled by the absence of a full merits-based appeal? Um, I think he's there looking at um, the lack of a right to challenge the appropriateness of the barring decision um, um, and um, his considering that. But, but the point we make um, is um, that it's important for the mistake of fact jurisdiction to apply in its terms, i.e. without any restriction, in order to maintain justice in the scheme and the, for the individual to have that right to challenge a decision which can have um, devastating effects for them, not just in terms of their career, but personally. And we say that must encompass the scenario where the individual says, I didn't do it. And they have the right to go for an oral hearing uh, before the upper tribunal and to have the credibility of that denial tested before a panel. And we say that, that um, is consistent with the broad width of the wording, but also the purpose of the Section 42B uh, jurisdiction. Um, I want to move on to uh, PF because that's, um, I think, the um, seminal case, really, in this area now. Um, it's been endorsed by uh, JHB and Kikimbe. And we say, again, that lies at the heart of whether uh, the upper tribunal in this case made any error. Um, and I want to take you to um, a few of the paragraphs in PF and make some submissions as I go on those. So, um, Authorities Bundle 87... And the starting point is, uh, we submit, is uh, Authorities Bundle 97. And we, we say that paragraph 39 is the proposition that's central to ground one of this appeal. There's no limit in the form that a mistake of fact may take. Um, this includes matters such as who did what, when, where and how. It includes inactions as well as actions. Um, and clearly... I'm so sorry, Mr Kent, I'm uh, behind you. Which, which page of the bundle? 97 of the authorities bundle, my lord, and it's paragraph 39. Yes, it's got there. Thank you. And it's a proposition that we say is central to the appeal on ground one. Um, because we submit that clearly the tribunal's mistake of fact jurisdiction permits it to assess whether the person did the impugned act uh, for which they're placed on the barring list. In this case, the tribunal's finding that RI did not steal the money was the crux of the appeal before it, uh, that the DBS finding to the contrary was mistaken. That's permissible by the breadth of uh, the meaning of a mistake of fact. And we say that the upper tribunal's conclusion falls four square within that breadth. Um, paragraph 42, uh, on page 98, one way but not the only way to show a mistake is to call further evidence to show that a different finding should have been made. The mistake does not have to have been won on the evidence before the DBS. It is sufficient if the mistake only appears in the light of further evidence or consideration. This is precisely what happened in this case. R.I. called herself her oral evidence was tested before the upper tribunal um, and, and the credibility of her denial assessed. And um, the mistake became apparent to the upper tribunal after that assessment, after that process, in light of its consideration of all the evidence before it, 
including the oral evidence from RI. Um, that's entirely permissible. And, and we note the high point in my learned friend's submissions as to direction by the Upper Tribunal to uh, PF, uh, paragraph 27 of the Upper Tribunal's reasons, uh, where she submits that the Upper Tribunal went wrong. We say it clearly didn't. It had in mind plainly paragraph 42, and that's exactly what it did do in its assessment um, of whether or not there was a mistake um, uh, of fact. Um, uh, paragraph 51C, so we have, um, we have the summary there. Um, sorry, just before I leap into 51 and the summary, at 49, we have the two extremes on the spectrum of the, um, the role of the DBS's reasoning in a particular case. And if I might note that the one extreme... Uh, identified there in the middle of that page where the tribunal has received significant further evidence and it's likely that its evaluation of the evidence that was before it will have been overtaken so that the only appropriate approach will be for the upper tribunal to begin afresh is on all fours with the instant case and the Kimbo type of case where the impugned act is denied and there's been <coughs> oral evidence which tests that denial um, the case of JHB is much more akin and I think this is what um, Mrs Justice Lang had in mind at paragraph 90, uh, where she says, in light of PF, is that second um, uh, extreme. If there is no further evidence put to the upper tribunal, the DDS's reasoning may well form the basis of the case that the appellant has to meet. Um, JHB, um, there was a, at best, part denial of the impugned act. The most serious aspects of the acts were admitted um, by JHB, which included the conviction, and there wasn't very much oral evidence. His account wasn't challenged. And so um, Mrs Justice Lang was quite right to rely on this part um, of the reasoning in PF at 90 to say um, that the DBS's reasoning is the starting point in the consideration. But we're in a quite different territory here, where there's a denial of the impugned act, and there's oral evidence where that denial is tested. Um, moving on you, to the you, summary... You, you, you'd of, you'd accept, I expect, that the DBS's position and reasoning is the starting point, and it always is in an appeal. You don't, you don't, um, unless it's a total rehearing starting from scratch, like Crown Court on appeal from the magistrates. But otherwise, you start with the decision below, and then... Would you accept a, a, the upper tribunal as before it, the oral evidence, the decision below, the written material on which the DBS may, made its decision, considers all that? Correct. I think um, we, can put, uh, we can express it no <coughs> better than the way the upper tribunal did in this case. We take it into account for what it is worth. And it did take that into account, but it also, when reaching its decision as to whether the um, decision uh, was a mistake of fact, it, con it considers all of the evidence as a whole, including the DBS decision. But it's a quite different scenario to the scenario at the second end of this, the, the JHB scenario, if I can call it that, where there really isn't very much um, in dispute and there isn't very much all the evidence. The DBS reasoning may well, for them, may well, not must, but um, may in practice um, form um, the basis of the case that the appellant has to meet. Um, so on the summary at 51, um, we, um, starting at C, in determining whether the DBS has made a mistake of fact, the tribunal will consider all the evidence before it and is not confined to the evidence before the decision maker the tribunal may hear all evidence for this purpose. That's precisely what the upper tribunal did below. A materially different and highly significant fact was the finding that RI was credible. And that was a, a finding that was made uh, following her oral evidence that was tested when they assessed its consistency with the documentary evidence and her witness statement that was not, none of that was before the DBS. Um, 
we've also got then D and E. Um, the tribunal has the power to consider all factual matters other than those relating only to whether or not it's appropriate for an individual to be included on a, in a bar list. So broad scope to consider all factual matters, including the individual's oral evidence. Uh, and in reaching its own factual findings, I'm now at E, the tribunal is able to make findings based directly on the evidence and to draw inferences from the evidence before it. So inferences unfettered, broad power to decide what inferences it chooses to draw. It doesn't have to be at the invitation or request of a party. It can sim it's simply a matter for it to consider inferences based on the evidence before it um, that relate to the act in question, the impugned act in question, and whether it's mistaken. Um, where a person has denied doing the impugned act, we submit, and it's obvious from Pierre, it's well within the scope of the tribunal's powers to reach its own findings on whether that act in fact occurred and to assess the credibility of a denial um, that the individual did that uh, impugned act. And we submit the short answer to this entire appeal is that the upper tribunal plainly had all of those propositions in mind and applied them carefully in its evaluation of the evidence before it. And I needn't take you to it, but paragraphs 5 and 26 um, and 27 of the upper tribunal's um, reasons clearly show that it had um, all the relevant passages in mind in PF and um, uh, and we submit it must be inferred um, that it applied them correctly um, in, its, in its approach. Um, there's nothing in the upper tribunal's decision to indicate otherwise in my submission. What do you say about the sentence in paragraph 38 of PF, which is the one on which Ms. Patry particularly relied? Um, it, it is not enough, that one. It's not enough that the upper tribunal would have made different findings. Um, <coughs> we, 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 well, um, that sentence speaks for itself. Um, in a sense, um, where you've got a scenario where the upper tribunal is reviewing the same evidence as the DBS, which is a scenario that you might get um, uh, in this jurisdiction, um, it would not be enough for the tribunal to simply disagree based on the same evidence and say it would have made different findings. However, where the upper tribunal has before it new evidence in the form of oral evidence by the individual whose account denial of the impugned act is rigorously tested in cross-examination and by judicial questioning, it's open to the upper tribunal, entirely open to them, to reach a different decision based on that evidence and conclude, therefore, that the DBS's um, finding to the contrary was mistaken. That is entirely permissible and consistent with, um, for example, 42 of PF. So I, I think the way to sum it up is the mistake of fact jurisdiction is a broad church. A very different, difficult um, end of the spectrum would be where the evidence is the same between the upper tribunal and the DBS. And what the upper tribunal has to be careful not to do is to um, simply make substitute its decision on the same evidence, make say it would have made different findings. But at the other end of that spectrum, you've got the oral evidence, the denial, the oral evidence where that account is tested and it's entirely open there for the mistake to become apparent after that assessment has been made and in its conclusion on the findings of fact that the upper tribunal makes. I wonder if we should read paragraph 38 as a whole. It's, it's under the heading mistake 37 and it says, last sentence, that decision stands unless and until the tribunal has decided there's been a mistake. Then it says, mistake is the word used. It says, don't talk about plainly, don't talk about the degree of confidence you have in the decision. Uh, what it is saying is, you've got to have a mistake. It's not enough to say, oh, I'd have reached different findings. You've got to say, look, you are wrong because you've made a mistake. There's no good trying to be diplomatic and say, oh, I would have reached different findings from you, you've got to say, no, you're wrong. She didn't steal. He didn't abuse the child or whatever. So it's not an attempt to 
define the scope of the Section 42B jurisdiction. It's simply saying you've got to be absolutely sure that it's wrong or that it's a mistake. And simply saying, I wouldn't have confidence, or it's not plainly wrong, or uh, I'm differing, <coughs> isn't enough. You've got to be exactly sure that it's a mistake mm. in the sense it's wrong. Sure. And, and we say I'm not sure the, about sure. The upcharging <laughs> does not fall foul yeah. of mm. that litmus test um, yeah, 38 yeah. in yeah. my respectful submission. Um, <coughs> um, so I think that deals with. Um, yes. And I want to now move to JHB. Yes. Uh, and what's the ratio of JHB? Uh, <laughs> You're writing a head note for the law report. I, 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 would, I have to confess, my lord, I would struggle um, to identify that. Um, but um, to J, JHB, we now turn. It's um, an authorities bundle um, two two zero. I'm sorry, um, authorities bundle 40. No, 220, I was right the first time. Yeah. Um, and um, can I begin with 90? I mean, I fully accept that we need to look at this decision in the rounds. Um, rather than to extrapolate what we might be hoping for from different parts of the decision. But I would like to start with, um, if I might say, an obvious point of distinction, which is at 90. And I think that JHB can best be understood as a case involving partial admissions. So... Um, JHB didn't challenge the facts underlying the conviction or finding one, but there are other aspects of the impugned conduct that were disputed. Um, and um, we know from the second sentence of 90 that the, um, the, 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 the finding made essentially by uh, Mrs Justice Lane is that the upper tribunal heard very limited evidence from JHB. So this is a far cry from a case um, like um, that of my crimes and that of Kahimbo, where the individual is saying all along, I deny doing the impugned act, they then go along to the upper tribunal um, with a witness statement saying, I want to be cross-examined, I want the right to be heard. And then they're cross-examined and asked questions by the tribunal, and then the decision is reached um, after that. Um, an entirely different type of case, in my respectful submission, than JHB. And um, what I was going to do is to add some flesh onto the bones of that submission, because I think my learned friend says, well, um, the oral evidence wasn't really of much value because um, RI didn't say anything new um, in the oral evidence. Um, with respect, with the grace of respect, that misses the point. Um, the point is RI denied theft and the upper tribunal had in considering her oral evidence, the benefit of assessing her credibility against documentary evidence, that would be documentary evidence that was before the DBS, but also the witness statement that she put in before the upper tribunal, and um, for that account to be tested in cross-examination and, and um, judicial questioning is qualitatively different to merely reviewing evidence that was before the DBS and coming to a different conclusion, which is, in, as I understand it, essentially the error that the upper tribunal fell into in JHB. Um, as, we, as we might see in the later paragraphs. Um, here, the position is qualitatively different, and I think we skipped over the transcript because... Um, the transcript is unfortunately missing my client's um, examination in chief and cross-examination. And so we've got an agreed note between us and the DBS as, as the best record yes. of that. But I wanted to take your lordships to it to underscore the importance of um, oral evidence as a, as a class of evidence. Um, and... Um, and as a point of factual distinction with, with JHB. So if we start off with one through eight, um, C-1-1-1. 
So this is the upper tribunal transcripts. Um, 139, um, the micro, this microphone is not working, of course. Um, and um, at 140, we've got the beginning of the transcript, which your lordships will know is 2.02 p.m., so the afternoon session with re-examination by council. Um, the missing part, um, uh, my lords, can be found in the DBS note. And if I can just sort of provide some navigation to that in terms of timings, um, if, if your lordships turn to 171... <coughs> This is the um, DBS note of the hearing, 171. Do we know when her evidence finished? We started at two o'clock. We do, and I'm going to get on to that in a moment, my lord. Um, we can see that 11.15 um, is when she starts, and we can see um, evidence in chief, CE, 11.27. And... Um, we then um, move on to all the way through to 175. There's a little over half an hour in chief, a break at 12.05 by the first hole punch on 175. And then cross-examination um, starts at 12.11, where it says resume, 12.11, you've got S. Uh, one of the initials of counsel for the DBS before the upper tribunal. And what we have um, is uh, a significant amount of cross-examination um, because if you then go to 181, the upper tribunal took a slightly late lunch on that day at 115, uh, 181, 115, to two o'clock, hmm. and that then brings us back to the start of the transcript at 1.40, where re-examination begins at 2.02 p.m. And so we've got an hour of cross-examination where um, RI's denial is challenged by counsel for the DVS. And then um, we've got re-examination um, at 140, and then we get to 141, questioned by the tribunal, um, a significant number of questions asked of RI by the tribunal. Um, and it runs on all the way to 154 of uh, the supplementary bundle. I can't give your lordships times on that, but the number of questions really speak for themselves. The um, uh, uh, account, the um, RI's oral evidence probed by the tribunal's questions, and then we get further re-examination at 154 um, by counsel for RI. Is it about two hours in the witness box? Yes, together? a significant stint, not as long as you might have in some cases, um, but a significant, not a trivial stint um, in the witness box, um, having your denial forensically challenged by counsel for the DBS and by the panel. And um, that's qualitatively different as a body of evidence. So the, the upper tribunal has all of that. And it's looked at demeanour, it's looked at consistency, um, with the documentary evidence, with the witness statement tendered for um, the upper tribunal hearing, is qualitatively different to a case of simply reviewing evidence, the same evidence that was before the DBS, and reaching a different conclusion in my respectful submission. The oral evidence has a four-dimensional quality to it in terms of, or maybe three dimensions, where you're not just considering what that individual said, in each answer to the question, you're also considering the tone, the way they said it, and the consistency with what they say, the denial essentially, with um, other documentary evidence and also their witness statements. All of that forms 
a body of evidence that was not before the DBS. And in my submission, the upper tribunal was entitled to take that new evidence into account and reach the finding that they did, that she did not steal the money. Um, I, I see that at page 154, as you happen to have taken a of it, um, the first question in further re-examination is about other members of staff who had access to the money, which is a ground two point. Indeed, um, and my lord. And in fact, um, the upper tribunal had asked um, that arose from a question that the upper tribunal had put to RI, one of the panel members. If you go to 142A um, and B, 142A and B, um, you can see those questions being asked. Um, they have equal responsibility when I'm not there. If I go on holiday, it'll be the other staff who are there to take over. So other people would be involved in some of these financial transactions at times. Yes, yes. Um, but it was primarily you if you were around. Yes, yes. So that's where that bit of evidence came from. It's then recorded as evidence in the upper tribunal decision and then is, forms the basis of the inference that's the subject of the challenge in ground two that I'll come on to in a moment. But it came out of questions being put by the panel member and re-examination. Um, well, there are a couple of points on that, as it seems to me, just looking at this for the first time. <coughs> well, one is that what she says in um, response to questions from the tribunal at 142 is indeed, as um, Ms. Patry submitted, that they, they have responsibility when she goes on holiday, which, Ms. Patry says, doesn't explain regular uh, loss of money. On the other hand, the further re-examination question at 154 uh, talks about access to the safe. So if the money was put into the safe for saving, as it was apparently supposed to be, then there's evidence there that other people had access to the safe. And more generally, is this evidence which was not mentioned in the representations of the DBS, because if so, it is at least on one view, new facts. And I think there was some uh, reference to this in um, RI's witness statement before the upper tribunal and um, paragraph four, so supplementary, supplementary bundle 111. Well, I was asking really about whether it's something which was not mentioned in the representations to the DBS. Um, when they took their decision, because... Yes, I'm, I don't believe it was, but I'm not 100% certain. Right. Okay. Um, All right, that's very frank. Um, I think that's, that's as far as I go with it. Um, <coughs> but um, there it is, it's, it's, it's evidence which um, the upper tribunal had. It could take in, into account in the round in reaching the findings it did on the evidence and the inferences that it can draw from that evidence those inferences not being limited, um, save um, insofar as they must be relevant to um, the um, facts um, that's subject to the um, appeal. Um, so that, I think, leaves um, the supplementary bundle and um, the uh, value of the oral evidence that the upper tribunal had before it, which we say was considerable new evidence not before the DBS. And I think that is a convenient juncture to move back to Kahimbo or forwards uh, to Kahimbo. Well, uh, um, are you going to say anything more about JHB? We, um, we looked at paragraph 90 of JHB, but um, Ms. Patry um, fills quite a lot of her submissions on things said in JHB. Um, so, my, my lord, yes. Um, so we're on two, three, five of um, the authority bundle, paragraph ninety of the JHB decision. Um, I've given you the submissions about points of distinction, but in terms of an analysis of the actual decision, um, it's right that ninety is not the end point. Um, turning over the page at 236, um, we've got 92 and 93. 
and the point there made about the disagreement about the evaluation of the evidence is not an error of fact. Um, and I think what's meant by that is in the context um, that's present in JHB, where there isn't really very much new evidence and you're really looking at the same um, material that was before the DBS, is, it, it echoes that um, part of PF that you can't just disagree um, with the DBS's evaluation of the evidence. That doesn't fall within the meaning of mistake. <coughs> um, 95 um, deals with um, some further points of principle decided in JHB, which materially, in my submission, support uh, and endorse PF and um, the material part of 95 in this case is where it says, second, the finding may also be wrong if it is a finding about which the ET has heard evidence which was not before the DBS, and that new evidence shows that a finding by the DBS was wrong, as the ET itself explained in PF. That's the, the class of mistake of fact here in this case, and also, if I might say, in Kembo as well. Um, so... Um, one struggles to identify with clarity the ratio, and I'm afraid I haven't um, read in any great detail the upper tribunal decision in JHB, but just a passing observation, that decision was about, I think, nine pages long, or something there and thereabouts. Um, on the face of it, it seemed a much less detailed consideration and decision than we have in this case, but that's just an aside. Um, we... Um, it is difficult to identify the ratio in JHP, could but... It, could, it, could it be that um, if, it, if it's contained in 92, it could be that um, if... if one can imagine a case where there's no, no oral evidence and no new material before the upper tribunal, the appellant simply gives notice of appeal. I, either nobody turns up or she turns up maybe represented and counsel makes submissions but not uh, it is said that um, on, on the case as it was before the DBS they shouldn't have found that the offence had occurred and I can see the logic of saying that you're, you're not show, un, unless you can show some logical absurdity, or as Patrick gave the evidence of some finding of fact which is clearly absurd because the dates are completely wrong or something. I, I can see that a court could say, well, the, the upper tribunal has no business simply to come to different conclusions on exactly the same written material but that tells you nothing about a case where they have had a witness statement but more to the point oral evidence um, and they've asked a lot of questions and then you say I imagine paragraph 92 of JHB tells us nothing about we're not that. In that. We're not remotely in that territory. Where we are in the territory is the um, 95 second, which isn't the ratio at all of JHB, because it's not no. the type of case that they were considering in JHB. But a uh, finding may also be wrong if it's a finding about which the UT has heard evidence which was not before the DBS, and that new evidence shows that the finding by the DBS was wrong. Well, that plainly encompasses this situation where the individual denies um, the impugned act. Um, they come along, give oral evidence. It's tested rigorously um, for two hours. And they say, well, you know, you didn't steal the money. And that, and therefore, um, the DBS finding otherwise is wrong. Um, it's a mistake. Um, we thought you were credible. The DBS thought otherwise, and they were wrong in that assessment. And we fall squarely then within that um, part of... Uh, really, PF that's that, that that is the guidance on that. So we're so in summary, 
we're distinct on the facts. There isn't anything in 92 that's remotely applicable to this case. And we're squarely within the territory of PF um, because there's new evidence in the form of oral evidence that wasn't before the DBS. Um, Kahimbo, um, my lords, you have our um, submissions in our four page second supplementary skeleton arguments. Yes. And so I don't want to spend long on Kahimbo for that reason. No, we, 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 um, my lord, being um, identified the salient aspects that we take from Kahimbo earlier on this morning in um, questions to Miss Petrie as to her position. Um, but we submit in short that in Kahimbo it's apparent that the upper tribunal can make conclusions on the basis of oral evidence that was not before the upper tribunal. That's perfectly permissible in light of PF. The upper tribunal is entitled to review any finding of fact, including who did what and when. Kahimbo is not quite on all fours, but is analogous and certainly much closer to the instant case than JHB. The individual in that case also denied doing the impugned act. The upper tribunal heard oral evidence from the individual that was not before the DBS. The upper tribunal made findings as to the relative credibility of the individual in the service user's account. All this, perfectly permissible, we submit in light of PF, which is good law, and precisely what the tribunal did in the instant case when it found that RI didn't steal the money and that her denial was credible having had the benefit of new evidence in the form of two hours of oral evidence being tested. Um, so that's what we take from Kahimbo. Um, the proposition of law in Kahimbo is that PF is good law, but the factual scenario in Kahimbo is, is not quite on all fours, but similar territory to the instant case and a far cry from what the court was dealing with in JHB. My lords, that deals with ground one. We say um, it should be dismissed for the reasons that I've given. I now turn to grounds two and three. And my lords, I don't want to be around the bush about this, but these grounds are weak. Um, well, I think you, you probably two, say that, 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 that um, there's no, on an appeal from the upper tribunal to this court, um, uh, the appellant has to show an error of law. Yes. And I suppose you say that um, grounds two and three um, as Patrick's submissions, they're dressed up as being failure to take into account material consideration, are a challenge to, to the findings of fact. That's quite right. And um, they are also... Um, they're dressed up um, points of fact, point number one. Also, with the grace of respect, they fall into the trap of really pernickety critiques of aspects of the tribunal's reasoning rather than looking at the tribunal's reasons in the round. Um, and if I might <coughs> begin with ground two, um, <coughs> paragraph 31 of the first skeleton argument of the DBS, um, page 26 of the core bundle. The legal premise for this ground, uh, one looks at paragraph 31, page 26. This is precisely the sort of error which was warned against by the Court of Appeal in AB. This is not a finding of fact, but an inference to be drawn from facts, and one which was not advanced by either party in any event. Now, um, <coughs> my Lord, Lord Lewis, will know full well what the ratio of AB was. It's certainly not. Um, uh, authority for the proposition that my learned friends um, attributes to it at 31. It provides no support whatsoever to um, ground two. And moreover, um, ground two says the opposite of what is permissible in PF. Um, we've seen the um, paragraph 51E of PF permits the tribunal to draw inferences from the evidence before reaching its own factual findings. That's all well within it's um, section 42B powers. Um, we say the tribunal's conclusion that others with opportunities to steal the money uh, was an inference it was entitled to draw 
and the evidence before it. So that being evidence in the claimant's, sorry, RI's witness statement before the upper tribunal, the passages in um, cross-examination and questions, sorry, re-examination and questions from the panel. Um, <clears throat> And it was a factual finding, not a value judgment in any event. Um, a finding with a legitimate evidential basis, as I've identified in the um, transcript, and as recorded by the tribunal. And I think it's right, as a proposition, a party doesn't have to invite a tribunal to draw a, an inference in order for an inference to be drawn by the tribunal. The tribunal is open to draw whatever inferences it likes from the facts it finds, from the evidence it hears, to form relevant findings of fact that relate to its ultimate decision. And in any event, this inference is just one tiny microscopic part of the close and careful reasoning given by the upper tribunal over some nine paragraphs um, that support its conclusion that RI did not steal the money. It's far-fetched in my submission, even if you're against me on all of that, and the inference is vitiated as a value judgment, to submit that this disturbs the overall conclusion that RI did not steal the money. So ground two has no merit in, in my respectful submission. Um, ground three equally... Um, Just before you leave ground two, um, you, you've seen what was said in the transcript in evidence about others having access. Was there any reference to that in the submissions of which we've also got the transcript, but I'm afraid I haven't read them all? Um, my Lord, I'm afraid I cannot um, assist with that particular query. You could provide um, that information given five minutes, um, but slightly different point it is recorded by the Upper Tribunal in its, in its judgments. I think it's paragraph eight, um, where it records uh, that evidence that then forms the basis for the inference um, that's under attack by ground two. So there was a legitimate evidential basis in my submission for the inference. It was uh, permissible for the tribunal to draw that inference. There is no error of law to see here. Um, ground two should be dismissed. Ground three, um, we set our position out in our first skeleton argument for your Lordship's reference, paragraphs 29 to 32, or 107 to 109. And just on the financial capacity assessment point, if I can deal with that first, it's just wrong to submit, as my learned friend does, that the tribunal overlooks the financial capability assessment because if you go to the core bundle we see there um, the beginnings of signs that this was a document that the upper tribunal had in evidence before it so paragraph one at the outset of the hearing we were provided with a document entitled financial capability assessment that's page 33 of the core bundle um, paragraph 14 <coughs> of the Tribunal's Judgment, page 36 of the Core Bundle, sets out the terms of the DBS's minded to bar letter, and one sees there um, the terms of the capability assessment, uh, the penultimate paragraph, the last sentence there, the fact that service users' financial capability assessment was written and signed by you, supports that you were well aware that there was a requirement for all the transactions that were made by the service user to be documented. So the upper tribunal had sight of that. It records uh, that letter, well aware of the terms of the financial capability assessment. And then we have at 24, on page 40 of the core bundle, if there, if there was any doubt about that, um, the Upper Tribunal says this at the beginning of 24, we have taken into account all of the documentary material before us. So it's plain that they had before them the financial capacity assessment, they were aware of the terms of that. Um, it didn't overlook uh, that evidence. But in any event, the fact 
um, that the uh, assessment required all transactions to be recorded has no bearing whatsoever on the separate question of whether there was any documentary evidence of the arrangement that RI had set out. This is the £100 transfer uh, to a cash card and account um, uh, to be spent by RV. What the tribunal is, is considering there is really the absence of documentary evidence of that arrangement, uh, supporting um, uh, a conclusion uh, that the arrangement... Uh, sorry, I'll rephrase that. Um, the absence... All that the, the upper tribunal is saying in, in terms of this arrangement is that the absence of documentary evidence to support that arrangement doesn't mean that the arrangement doesn't exist. And that's just a correct statement of logic, that absence of evidence is not evidence of, ab uh, of absence. Uh, the uh, terms of the financial capability assessment with the grace of respect were nothing to the point. Um, that's why we don't see any further uh, reference to it in the upper tribunal's reasons on that point. Um, the evidence provided by the employer point, my learned friend says, well, that was overlooked because they had the letter of dismissal before them, and that was an error of law. But that, with respect, mischaracterises what the tribunal said. Um, if you go to paragraph 36, um, at 42, it's a core bundle, what they say on this point is not that they had no evidence at all from the employer, but that we also note that we've received no evidence provided for the purposes of these proceedings before us from employer B or any of its staff refuting the claimed existence of such an arrangement. It might be, and it's, it's perfectly possible, for an employer to reduce witness statement evidence and to tender witnesses to be cross-examined before the other tribunal and to challenge um, the appeal. But what all the, the upper tribunal is saying there is that they didn't have any of that. And um, that's just a correct statement of facts. They didn't. All they had was the letter of dismissal. So um, there's simply no error of law at all in ground three. And um, it's an impermissible attempt to try and rerun the case. It's not for this court. Uh, this court can't deal with that. Um, and so that ground has no substance and should be dismissed. I think then, in conclusion, I've given you all my submissions now on all three grounds, and the, the appeal should be dismissed for the reasons that I've given. Um, and I, I should say briefly on the disposal, um, it is um, sad and um, unfortunate indeed that it's been six years since the incidents in dispute. That's a long period of time. In my submission, it's unfair and oppressive for the whole case to be reopened if the DBS win. Um, so our primary position on remission, if um, my learned friend wins, contrary to my submissions, is that there should be no order as to remission because um, RI is no longer on the list. Uh, it's, it would be unfair and oppressive for the whole thing to go back. Uh, alternatively, um, we say that um, a similar approach should be taken as that in Kahimbe, the last paragraph about different decision maker and being minded of passage of time and risk um, if, if they are to remake the decision. But it is a wholly unsatisfactory state of affairs where you've got an incident that occurred six years ago um, for the whole thing to go back to the DBS for a rerun, even if there is a further right of appeal. But hopefully we won't get to that if you accept my primary submissions that this appeal should be dismissed. So, my lords, unless there are any further questions from the bench. Um, yes, um, my learned junior has just handed up a note dealing with um, Lord Justice Mayle's question about the submissions. Yes. And um, we can't see that any direct submissions were made below. Point not made directly. Um, on other people that could have stolen the money. Um, no, well, I had a quick skim through and I couldn't see anything. I think um, counsel for the DBS, sorry, counsel for RI invited the upper tribunal to take into account all the evidence. 
that's as far as it goes, um, my lord. Unless I can be of any further assistance. Thank you very much, Mr. Kemp. Mr. Gilly, anything to add? <coughs> Ms. Patrick. Thank you very much. As ever, no need to repeat anything in April. Oh, no, my anything you'd like to say in not improve with repetition, yeah. so let's, let's not go there. I'm just going to re respond just briefly to some of the points raised just now. The first point which I'd like to respond to is reliance on the case of RCN. Just, just a word of caution about that. These cases are obviously all important, but that's an old case. It doesn't deal with the point in question now. So nobody made submissions in that case on exactly how wide the mistake of, fact of jurisdiction ju uh, should be. So I, I just express a word of caution before reading too much into what is said in that case, which is really dealing with the compatibility of the scheme as a whole with Article 6 and 8. So that's all I wish to say about that, it's the first thing to say. Sorry. Um, turning to the substance of ground one very briefly indeed, I think we've, we've got to kind of like a slightly more narrow place than we had this morning. So I think my learner friend said, well, in, in a case where there is no new evidence, no oral evidence, no new evidence at all, then uh, that's one thing. And in those circumstances, it would not be appropriate for the tribunal to effectively substitute its own conclusions for that of the DBS. I think that's where, what the submission was. Um, and then secondly, if there is no significant evidence, a bit a GHB type situation, then again, the starting point should be the D DBS's decision and there cannot be an ultimately just a reconsideration um, or, and substitution of, its own, of the a tribunal's own findings. But this there is the third situation, says my learned friend, where there was significant oral evidence um, two hours in the witness box, questions by both counsel and the panel itself. And the dispute between us is, is rather more narrow than first anticipated. It, it, it really is. If that's right, it, it, if we are in that third category of cases where there is significant oral evidence, does there need to be new something new or is assessment of credibility enough? I think, I think that's where we have got to and that's where, where we differ. And my learned friend says it is enough, it's enough for someone to come along, spend several hours in the witness box, and then appear uh, and then be found to be credible. That's sufficient. And we say it isn't. I think I think that's where we've got to. And that's really helpful because I just want to outline kind of where we had got to. Um, and I think what my learned friend, in, insofar as my learned friend is saying GHB isn't wrongly decided, then I then I agree with that. It isn't. And it was a different set of circumstances. What's your answer to the question? Is the fact that you may need to assess credibility enough to constitute new evidence for getting into 95-2? Well, it, I think the answer is it depends on um, it depends on the, the nature of the oral evidence, doesn't it? So we, we say someone who comes along and who may be in the witness box for two hours or two minutes or whatever it may be, but who says exactly the same thing, that wouldn't be sufficient. But if someone comes along and gives new evidence or gives it or um, gives new evidence such that it's possible to draw a different inference from the facts or gives evidence which um, yeah which, which, which puts forward something which um, the DBS had not considered previously, then yes, of course we're in a different territory and it is open to them to do what a tribunal of this did. So I think that's why I say that the submissions, on behalf of my learned friend, or, or, or of my learned friend, are um, have have taken us to a point where the, the points of difference between us are rather narrower than it might so be. So the answer is, the simple fact that you've heard the person say essentially that which was previously put in writing, yes, uh, and you're assessing her credibility, that isn't enough to constitute new evidence. If in the course of giving her evidence, she refers to something that's different or nuanced differently, that might be enough. Yes, exactly. That leads to a very odd forensic position, doesn't it? Because imagine <coughs> that the person concerned comes along to the upper tribunal yeah. with a witness statement yes. which says precisely what was said in representations to the DBS. Uh, no, no more, but no less. Uh, they go into the witness box, they confirm the truth of that witness statement, 
Well, then if um, counsel for uh, the DBS starts asking them questions, mm -hmm. there's a danger that some new evidence might come out, which will enable the UT to form their own assessment and all the rest of it. So the astute um, position is to make, answer no, to ask no questions in cross-examination, because then uh, the council will be, will be entitled to submit that the evidence is precisely the same and that it's uh, JHB territory. But it's not... That doesn't make sense, does it's it? Not a, it's not a danger. I mean, the, the, the DBS, with respect, is a, is a public body that has no interest in barring someone who does not deserve to be barred. They make a decision based on the evidence they have. And if, following cross-examination, new evidence comes out and the tribunal decides that that justifies mistake of fact, happy days. I mean, that's, that, that's, it's an entirely appropriate in those circumstances for the tribunal to reach a different decision. We've got no, the DBS has no interest in wrongly barring people. So but it, has a, it has a firm view that it's rightly barred people. On, on that's, the, why it, that's why it resists on the appeals. It has. On the evidence it has. Yes, because its specialist decision makers have assessed the facts and assessed risk and come to the conclusion. But They're not specialist fact assessors in that sense. They're specialist risk assessors. They, are. they know exactly what people who are grooming children and doing bad they things do. to them are. But whether somebody's stolen money or not is not really something that a DBS official is a specialist in, is it? There, no, you're, you're right. Oh. Findings of fact, just as a general concept, that's right. Um, there may be situations where um, specialist expertise can come to bear on the assessment of facts in a particular but case. Because there's only presence. Somebody says, I have always sent presents to boys or girls aged 10. And somebody says, oh, no, that's how grooming starts. Exactly. So, so there are though there might be some circumstances in which an assessment of facts generally. is better, but generally not. A a that's absolutely true. Um, so now, this is like the case in the magistrates' court, isn't it? This one. This the facts of the present yes. case, or the no, exactly the facts of the present case. I didn't do it. I uh, didn't take his mind. Yes, but going back to the question I was asked previously, just to try and answer that question as well. Um, yes, I mean, there's no doubt that this is always going to be a slightly tricky exercise because... Well, your, your answer really is that the DBS is a public body and it wouldn't play those forensic games. Well, exactly. And not all, it wouldn't, genuinely wouldn't. But the um, but it already is having to do a tricky exercise. The tribunal's already having to do a tricky exercise of when it's deciding whether it's in GHB territory or whether it's in a case like the present it's already a difficult exercise isn't it? because you're going to have to decide at some point whether there was sufficient new new evidence i'll put that in the widest possible terms um in order to put us outside ghb territory or whether it was something where someone effectively just came along and said a few limited things about something that weren't wasn't really an issue in any event so it's already a difficult exercise so my respectful submission it's so perfectly perfectly possible for the tribunal to also say, well, okay, this person did come along and did give evidence, but frankly, they just repeated everything they'd said in their written representations, and it takes us no further. And in those circumstances, I can't just substitute my, my thinking for that of the DBS. Okay, thank you. Because it's, I, just, I, I'm, I think it's important to delineate that so that we don't end up in a situation where GHB is misunderstood. Um, so that's, well, that's, a, that. that's a matter for us. Of course it is. And then grounds two and three, and I think the really important thing to say here is that if I'm wrong about ground one, um, and actually there is almost a sort of, it's, it's assuming someone comes along in the day and gives significant evidence and puts their credibility up for grabs, etc., then we're in a different territory with what the tribunal has to achieve at that point. It has to then, if it's going to do a full re-evaluation of the facts, it's got to do it right, and it's got to do it fairly. It's not just a review anymore, is it? We aren't just saying, oh, well, you know, here's the DBS decision, did the DBS get it wrong? We're suddenly back to, is this right? Now, the DBS, without you know, with, without being completely candid, is good. If you, if your judgment goes against me on this, is going to have to fundamentally rethink these hearings. It's going to have to decide whether it calls evidence, whether it brings witnesses, whether vulnerable people um, who may have been assaulted or have had money stolen from them are going to have to be called. All that is going to be tricky, and that's that, that's fine. But ultimately, there is going to have to be by the decision maker a very careful 
analysis of what ha what happened. Did the person steal or did they not? And that's going to involve a careful consideration of all the relevant material, written, oral, I was going to say and anything else, but I'm struggling to see what there could be other than written or oral evidence. Now that means that you can't, as a decision maker, ignore key parts of the evidence. And what I say in grounds, in grounds two and three goes no further than that. I say, if you assume that their role was to rehear the facts, which I say is wrong, but if, I, if I'm wrong about that, if that was their role, then they had to take the role seriously. And they had to, for example, not say the wrong thing about, um, about um, the evidence that they had before them. So the two grounds, the first one is about, um, just give me one moment. Well, it's um, about, they're both about paragraph 36. 32, it doesn't want, is it one of them? 32? 32 and one of 36. No, 32 and 36. Yeah. And you say that these are errors of law. Yeah, so, so, they, um, they had the evidence, they heard some evidence, um, which I paraphrased in when I was giving my submissions, but, um, they had some evidence that there there were other workers who dealt, you know, other support workers who helped the service user um, and who might have had the opportunity um, to have access to his or his finances in some way. And she said, the evidence given clearly, and we looked at it, so I won't take you to it again, was that um, when she was holid on holiday or she wasn't around, that might be good. She then asked a question um, about the safe, and she says, uh, yes, other people had access to the safe. Now, bear in mind that the safe, I, and the reason I, I, I deal with this because there was a question about this um, from your lordship. The question wasn't whether there was money in the safe. The issue, the, the, the and I really hate to go back through this, but the position on behalf of the employer and then the DBS was that a standing order was set up to transfer money into a separate account and then it should not be withdrawn. So it should not have been in the safe. And the position um, of, um, ultimately the position of the respondent was, well, he was withdrawing it and he was spending it. He was frittering it away. I think that she, she describes it on separate occasions. The DBS's position is um, she stole it. But what they say at 32 is, thus we conclude there would have been opportunities, others with opportunities to steal, to steal the money, so that this is not a case where the appellant was necessarily the only candidate. Now, I see that's just, it just fundamentally, was, fundamentally wasn't open to the tribunal on the evidence, written, oral, or anything else. There was no one, and you'll, in, in answer to your Lordship's question, there was no submission made that someone else might have stolen the money. That was not the submission. No, hold on. I, I, of maybe I've misunderstood this. No, no. The first question is, was it only a savings account? It should have gone in for savings yes. and that's it. Yes. If they don't accept the DBS's view that it was only for savings, and even though it should have been written down, yes. and even though there's no written agreement saying that it could be written, if the money has, in fact, been taken out of the account rather than we see it, if that has happened, yes. the next question is, was she the one who then took it? There are two stages, if you like, and all they're saying is, well, assuming she gets over the first hurdle, where's the money gone? And the answer is, well, you know, other people could have taken it. So I don't think they're saying somebody else stole it. This is part of an overall picture, isn't it? It could have come out for spending reasons. If it did come out, you need to bear in mind, to be fair to her, she's not the only one that could have taken it if, in fact, it's come out. But but that wasn't her case. She, her case was he'd, it was taken out and he spent it. And, and in fact, that was the whole purpose of giving him that extra £100 a month or a week, mm -hmm. is that he would then have money. I mean, it didn't make much sense because on one, on one, set, on one level she was saying it was to teach him to be wiser with money and to make sure that other people didn't have access to his money on, when, when they shouldn't have. But on the other hand, she said it was for him to do as he wished. She didn't say other people stole it. She said he no, spent it. You do understand that. I, I really do understand that. And you've told us three times in case I missed it earlier. Sorry. But the real question is, you're saying 
that, uh, and I just don't understand it, you're saying that paragraph 32 means they must have gone wrong completely because they are thinking, oh, somebody else has stolen it. And I'm wondering if you can really put so much weight on that. All it's saying is if, in fact, the money has come out um, and has gone missing rather than being saved, so two things have happened, it could have been somebody else. But that's not the reason why they don't think it was her. If, in fact, she, if it had come out and gone missing and she was the only one who could possibly have taken it, that would have been quite bad in the But all they're saying is, hmm, that isn't against her. It is not a case where the appellant was necessarily the only candidate. That's all they're saying. No, that's right. But, but that was the, the, point, the only point I make is that that was no one's case. No one was advancing that proposition. And there was no evidence that someone else had taken the money. That's all I see, I think. And then we've got to turn to 36 which is the lack of documentation point, um, when we, we say that there was, a, there was clear evidence from the employer in the dismissal letter. Yes, but yep. Mr Kemp's point is different. Mr Kemp's point is that that's a misreading. Mr Kemp's point was that all they were saying there, and in fact, yeah, was that in the proceedings before them, the employer or the member of staff hadn't given evidence. That's, he's saying what he's saying. I know, but, but with the greatest of respect, there was only before it, the written evidence that had been received by the DBS. Yeah. That's all it had. And there is no, um, there was never, there never was, and there never is further evidence served by the DBS um, in the in the Epoch Tribunal proceedings confirming something or otherwise. That That's just simply not the way it works. And to say somehow, um, it, well, it, well, the tribunal, there's no evidence the tribunal ever requested. They didn't see at any point, either before the hearing or during the hearing, why haven't we got X? Um, to see, and then in the decision, um, we received no evidence provided for the purpose of these proceedings, um, when in fact there was, there was clear evidence, but just not in these proceedings. It seems to me like a... a, a I mean, that, that makes it, in a sense, it makes it even worse. Well, because there you are. Anyway, if you say that's an error of law, which... We say that these two errors, um, once you've concluded that this is uh, effectively a rehearing on the facts because of the credibility issues at stake, then there is uh, an undeniable that, that well, the, the decision maker has to make a careful, considered, and um, error free decision. And in circumstances where there's, they've made the two errors that I've identified, um, yes. We say that those are, are significant errors, and if they had corrected, done the, if they had been right about those, if they had correctly assessed the situation, they may well have reached a different decision. Which is all I need to say. Yes. Uh, can I answer any? Well, let me just double check my notes before I. Can I just double check? No, I think that was everything I wanted to say. Is there anything else I can help you? With? You want me to deal with the remedy point that was raised in the end? We'll, we'll uh, rise and see if, there, um, if there's any further point we yes, of course. Not put to either of you, and um, whether we're in a position to give a result today, they're not reasons today. Yes, of course. <coughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah.
Sounds like it. We have unanimously come to the conclusion that the BBS's appeal should be dismissed. We will um, give reasons for that uh, in writing at a later date. Um, uh, the usual procedure will be followed. We will send out 
a draft. The draft is not for re-argument, but for the correction of obvious factual errors like names and dates and so forth and any typos. Um, the, uh, the draft judgment is not for publication uh, until a formal hand down, but since we've announced the result today, there's obviously uh, it, it's uh, entirely permissible for uh, that to be communicated to uh, the appellant, uh, anyone in the DBS who wishes to know, indeed anyone else who wishes to know. Um, is there any other matter we should deal with today? M Mr. Kemp, uh, uh, you and Mr. Gilly are um, instructed by Advocate. We are particularly grateful to you for uh, appearing on that basis. Um, if you are, I don't know whether you're seeking uh, a, a special order for costs under uh, a statute which I can never identify, not in your favour, but in favour of the system. But um, uh, could you think about that? And if you are making such an application, we can deal with it in writing uh, at the time of the handdown. My Lord, yes, I was going to propose that we deal with any consequentials once we have the benefit of your yes. written judgment in due course. Yes. I'm grateful. All right. Any other business for today? Thank you all very much for your assistance.